Here we go. Around. This is how we f around. This package is designed to help you navigate the coder experience. Here's our route. We're going to Atlanta, Georgia. A town down. Nah. Nashville, Tennessee. Okay, Tokyo. Stairs are warm. That's <laughs> look at this one. Old hands, blunt kick foot big. Yo, wow. Pose for new drawing by Ed Templeton. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shaking just looking at this. Look at <laughs> Sue King of the Road. It's horrifying. two weeks of just madness. <laughs> it's a skateboarding scavenger hunt road trip. There's three teams of top pro skaters, and they all have to go on different routes around America, and they try to accomplish all these special challenges. Some of those challenges are based on skateboarding's past. <laughs> Some are life challenges, too, where you just have to endure certain painful experiences. I guess I would kind of call it a scavenger hunt for debauchery ah! and skateboarding tricks. Yeah! It's so psychotic. <laughs> You're going to do what? Every challenge is kind of set up to almost get you beat up. But that's what makes it fun. King of the road to somebody who doesn't skate, the craziest skateboarding that exists. You have to be mentally ready for it. Like, I'm going to go on this trip where I'm not going to sleep, I'm not going to eat well, I'm just going to be skating and trying crazy stuff. Like a boxer, you have to punch yourself a couple times. Am I going to do this? Ah. And once you say yes, like, you're going down the rabbit hole. And you can't go down half ass. It ain't the road trip where you go, hey guys, man, let, let's go up to Yosemite this weekend and have no a spring break. It's not just about like being on your skateboard, you know, it's about being a dirt bag too. That's what I like about it. It's king of the road, dude. It's a up challenge. It's just up stuff. Skateboarding's about hilarious bullshit with your friends, you know? Just skating hard and just laughing. I love it. So usually there's like one page that has all the keepers on it. It's like the easiest way to find the good stuff. I put together Thrasher Magazine, work with all the photographers, plan issues and events, and I'm also a photographer and a writer. I was a total disciple of skateboarding well before I even imagined I could get a job. I started skateboarding in around 1986. I loved Thrasher way before I worked for him. I read Thrasher like it was the Torah, studying it over and over again. My wife used to do this when we first met. She could open any magazine from the 80s and I could tell her the caption. Not just who it was, but I could 
tell her the wording of the caption because it was like <laughs> it was like staring at that Zeppelin album like what does it mean Thrasher has consistently been the purest and rawest depiction of skateboarding for the past 34 years they came along when we really f needed them and they believed in a bunch of f kids that nobody believed in they've always made it a point to provide a voice for skateboarding that is like you know pretty accurate to the ethos of a young skater you know school sucks got like cops or dicks i think thrasher steers like the reader's attention to like the rawness of skateboarding go fast get hurt don't give a f that's like every kid's little dream is like to be in thrasher if you get the front of a magazine that's respected, there's something that went into that, some hard work. What's your certificate of excellence, I guess? <laughs> as cheesy as that sounds. Like, I look at it, and I'm still so stoked every time. All the guys I looked up to have been on the front of this, like most all of them. And then to get into that category, that's just dream come true, straight up. All the juice for Thrasher. Thrasher is skateboarding. The first time I was actually in Thrasher was when I was this big. So, yeah, that, that happened. My mom wasn't particularly stoked on this sexy lady coaxing her probably seven-year-old or eight-year-old kid. Oh, that's not, that's not your mom? No, that's not my mom. <laughs> Just coming in here with my dad is an exciting place to be. My dad's Fausto Vitello. He came here from Argentina. He was obsessed with baseball. I mean, he actually learned how to speak English listening to broadcasts. He was a really kind of multi-dimensional dude that got into skating much later in his life. Thrasher was founded in San Francisco, 1981. It's a family-owned, independent business. I'd rather die before somebody you know, be a partner in, in Thrasher or something or have like a stake in what we do. We don't censor anything to make it more palatable for like an audience outside of skateboarding. Thrasher is the spirit of Skate and Destroy. Huh. He moved to this building in 1988. I've been working in this building since 1989, but I've worked for the mag for 30 years. Thrasher is a cool older brother. You know, somebody will tell you, what it is, what it ain't. You know, don't go down that street. Don't hang out with that dude. This kind of place sucks. Don't ever go there. The park blows. That guy's a goon. Don't go there. Bikers suck. They always have. It's just, you know, that's why Thrasher is and exists because it's the voice of reason in the world full of mediocrity. Thrasher was a little too heavy for a lot of people with that Thrasher ideology of like, F it. We don't care. And a lot of times, you know, we just really didn't give a shit. You know, like if we spelled it wrong, oops, who won the contest? We didn't get a photo. Sorry. We're still doing 220 page mags. Nobody's doing that. Why we stayed in business all these years is the fact that we know what we're doing. No one tells us what's rad. I told you that. Jaws, the biggest dolly in the world. This should be a King of the Road challenge. Kick foot that. <laughs> Mike came at me with the concept for King of the Road in 2003. My good friend Chris Coyle and I were just shooting the shit, and he's like, what about a skateboarding cannonball run? And I'm like, yeah! And we just started, like, coming up with just the funniest ideas. And I brought it to Thrasher. I told Jake, I was like, okay, here's what it's going to be. It's called King of the Road. Nobody said shit. Like, okay, we're doing it. Welcome to the uh, Thrasher King of the Road, everybody. Like, if you were to take a cross-section of 10,000 road trips and write down the ridiculous thing of each time, that's what I tried to do. I try to take like all the dumb shit that accidentally happens. Let's make points. So you have to do that. Forcing the fun. I don't know. I think I was too young to know better. Like to just go like, what? That'll never f work. Like I was just like, ha ha! This will work. I don't know how it came together. 
but we got four teams and we went coast to coast. And it wasn't really about like, let's make them do this crazy escape tricks. It was more just like the road trip that you talk to your friends about for the rest of your lives. Let's make one that's going to be worth writing about. I was thrown in the king of the road when I was 17. I was pretty unknown, but I guess they just saw me as being this hungry kid, and I ended up winning the MVP. I was stoked. Everyone on your team is counting on you just like the next dude. Yeah, I'll make out with this chick. She was like 25, and Diego made out with her mom. I'd be surrounded by like pros and ams of like a high caliber. And it's either you blow it or you f kill it. From when it started in 2003 to now in 2015, the level of skating is insane. King of the Road's responsible for, for pushing the progression of skateboarding in some cases. King of the Road is in a lot of ways like a stepping stone to like what is possible. It's 2015, people are jumping down. 16, 20 stairs, and if you were to look back 10 years ago, you'd be like, what? certain point where you're like working hard enough where you're like this is for a scavenger hunt contest like what the f i'm killing myself over this shit <laughs> this last year was just through the roof challenge wise piggyback transfer with teammate a spawn oh my god <laughs> i knew the skaters we had I knew they could handle it. I knew we had Jaws. I knew we had Nigel Houston. I knew we had Alec Majerus. And these guys are animals. I think watching Evan Smith land the Nolly Tray flip on board was insane. I told Mike, I was like, nobody will ever do it. And he'll put it in the book. And sure enough, he went back there and did it. Holy shit, like, I can't believe he did that. Nobody's ever done that before. And he did it on King of the Road with all of his buddies. And it meant a lot. Like, it means a lot anytime these guys land a trick. But to do a trick with all your guys under this circumstance, insane. This is the stankiest stank leg challenge. Ain't no one gonna be stankier than this leg. Yeah, king of the road. Welcome to it. Smear some shit on yourself. Go get 150 points. <laughs> It's totally overwhelming to be in charge of the chaos, so you just realize that you're not really in charge of it. So you just kind of poke and prod it from the sides and just hope it stays on track. That's the main thing is just stay on target, stay on target. As far as planning King of the Road, I write notes down all year long of different challenge ideas, different thoughts. And then once I'm about a month or two months away, I start really boiling it down and getting the book and getting the teams committed. <laughs> I don't know that I've reached the limit of challenges, bad behavior, because 
You reach the ceiling, God opens the skylight. It's all pretty surprising out there. You got to eliminate some of your dignity and go right in. Like a lot of the challenges are dignity eliminators for sure, yeah, in my yeah. opinion. In a funny way. Right? I was surprised when, I wasn't surprised that he got his nipple pierced, but I was definitely yeah. surprised when he demanded that I pay to get the other one pierced. I it felt weird having just one. I felt like might as well just get the other one done, right? Like. <laughs> What are, what are some of the other stranger challenges like that? Make out with the, <laughs> make out with the juggalo. Make out with the juggalo. Check into a hotel with wearing nothing but stickers. Hello. Hello, oh, man. I need to get a room. Today's my birthday. All I know is that it's gotten gnarlier with the years. It seems like every year it gets crazier and crazier. The shit you get into is just like shit that you would never get into ever unless you're on King of the Road. You can't even believe like that there's so many random challenges. But then somehow the stars and moon align where it's like check into a hotel with nothing but stickers, make out with a girl, and then somehow a girl is standing in the lobby of the place that you're naked and stickers checking in. And it just happens. Like and you're like, you can't even write that. Okay. Okay, I just thought I would make it good, okay? A key thing the king of the road would be you need to know people with f up scruples and their phone number. All right, you're gonna have to find a, a chick on acid and a pregnant chick, and you're like, oh, I know somebody who can fire this both. There's also uh, most makeouts, and um, I think that's the shittiest challenge there is, because it's the only challenge that at all times you have to be doing it. You're eating, you know, it doesn't matter what you're doing, and you see like a group of girls, and everybody's like, dude, gotta do it. So yeah, as far as the makeouts, like once you get into these waters, you realize that there's a lot of people out there ready to make out. <laughs> so I guess we're just filling a void. The making out with all the chicks, that one's fine, but I like like make out with the old chicks. One time when the trip first started, like I was in this McDonald's and this lady was working behind the counter and she seemed like excited and, and down for like skating and stuff. And I was like, hey, you're over 40, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I started making out with this girl. And then a, a minute later, uh, our photographer, Lance Dawes, walks up and he's like, you're, not, hey, you're not over 40, right? No. And, and I'm like, what the f***? And everybody just started dying like, you just made out with this chick for no reason at all. No reason, no points. Just random clerk, just for the hell of it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I had to make out with a bunch of old ladies. That was, uh, can we talk about that? So this 63-year-old lady, she has minimal teeth. N like none. Like, I thought she was just going to swallow my whole face yes. off. She tried, to, she tried to eat me, dude. Oh, it's so bad. It is bad, dude. It was rough, man. Making out with, like, some old strippers that we meet at Waffle House or whatever, that's hazardous. It's almost like they want you to almost die. We had to find a chick that looked like somebody from our team, and so we found this chick that looked like Jaws, and it was actually really good, but the crazy thing was is she was actually kind of hot. The look-alikes, always fun. 
When I first saw the girl look like one in the book, I was like, hmm, that's going to be interesting for whoever has to do that. And of course, it comes down to being me. There's an I just look alike. She could kickflip. She made out with him, and she broke her board, so it was a triple threat. She was super cool about the whole thing. There's always something you were, I guess, written on there. You're like, oh, no one's going to do this, and somebody always tries. <laughs> Like skating naked, all right? I don't know. A lot of people don't like the naked stuff. There's some macho, macho men. I think it's pretty funny. You could do the gnarliest trick naked or whatever. So that's when all like the homies are like, uh, all right, well, you just go with the filmer over there uh, naked and we'll, we'll be over here doing our thing or whatever. So the filmer's got to be like, okay, all right, you got it. You got it this time. Just, just filming the naked homie. You know, it's like, oh, it's kind of sick and twisted. Tommy took naked every year. He just raised the bar so high, ollieing huge sets of stairs naked. <laughs> yeah, if you were to fall on your private parts naked off a 20 stair, it could, yeah, it could ruin your life. Damn. No one wants to get naked, sit unless you're at Templeton. I don't have like a big c or anything. I don't know, you know, so I don't know how I am always the one who has to get naked. But I guess I'm secure with my small wiener to like not care enough. And maybe I'm, maybe since I'm married, I don't have anything to lose by showing the world my little pecker. Deanna calls it the tater tot. So Jeremy Rogers was just hyped, so hyped to be naked. He was kind of like a new kid coming out, super popular, and he really showed his true colors on that trip, just so down to get naked and just, it foreshadowed his future, which is, uh, he's been arrested for naked episodes. Is this a lot? I didn't mind being naked. One is either well endowed or not. And it was just more funny. I was just a young kid on the tour. It was just jokes, you know? See, the situation is the manual pad might have a little bit more wax on it than it's supposed to because I don't think it's supposed to have any. King of the Road is really hard and probably harder than any contest I ever did skate, you know? And definitely weirder. <laughs> well, my kissing posture right there doesn't look very, like, at ease with this situation. I'm really glad I did it, though. I mean, it was a great experience. It just, it was like so hard. I was like, I would have no interest in trying to do that again. Like, I don't care if I win that. Like, it's too tough. I think the Birdhouse team set the precedent with that beer anima as a practical joke. That was ruthless. Oh. One of my favorite challenges in the book every year is to prank one of your teammates. Nobody told Jaws to drink a beer with an enema. That was not in the book. And his teammates knew that he would do it because he was gullible enough. Because I didn't look at the book. That was a problem. I didn't look at the book. <laughs> and so I knew he probably didn't even know if that was in the book or not. And uh, so I was like, hey, who's going to do the butt chug? And Jaws was like, ah, oh, f it, I guess I'll do it. The funnel was like that thick, and that's like, that's big. That's big. <laughs> you don't ever want to see that. If you haven't seen that, you don't want to see it because it is not pretty. Oh, shit. One team member sleeps in the van for a week. What? what? Oh, oh, sleep in there for a week? I'm going to start a week of sleeping in the van today. It's the 10th of August at 6 a.m. It's so hot. <laughs> Nobody has to do anything. It's all based on what they're willing to do and what they're willing to try in the book. And a lot of this stuff is not fun and not easy, and it's not something that they would naturally want to do. So the team that just muscles through and tries to get as much stuff done and get strategic and skate as hard as they can, that ends up being the team that wins. Every single person broke at one time or another, you know. 
People get stressed, people get beat down, people get hurt, people get sad. Because by day nine, we're, everybody's ready to whip out knives and slit each other's throats. By day 11, there's a fist fight. Ty came at me one time. Why don't you shut up and drive? I said, do your job, shut up and drive. Dude, I'm like, oh my God, dude, I'm gonna smash Tommy Guns right now. I'm gonna choke him to death in the van right now. The book never disappointed. It always delivered, you know? It always delivered that it was gonna take us to the limits and, and past the li or limits to a breaking point. To a level of frustration and anger and hate ah! for skateboarding that you never even you know, knew existed. And that's why I loved it so much, is because I felt like it was bringing out the best of us, bringing out the worst of us. I was almost addicted to it. You have to sleep less, eat faster, eat on the road, eat on the run. Don't do anything outside of the challenges because you're racing the clock. From the time you wake up at like eight till like four in the morning, you know, you're like just going. It's like you either do this or you don't. So like I said earlier, ante in. Once you ante in, you're in the game. And we're playing for keeps for the next 12 days. You know, we were just so hyped to not get last place. Because that was the main goal. Don't get last. That was probably everybody's main goal. We tried so hard. I mean, we gave it every single thing we had, and we got dead last. I don't think we even thought about winning like when we were on it. You know, in retrospect, we realized like, oh yeah, Ed gets up every morning and takes the team to Whole Foods. And my penchant for getting eight hours of sleep and eating good food is not the way to win King of the Road at all. I don't think I realized the magnitude of how hard it is to win the competition suffered the consequences of getting dead last. The first year especially, maybe there was one team that said, I didn't think you guys were serious. And I think once they got back and they saw like what everybody else did, they were like, oh shit, this was for real. And in first place, Jamie Thomas, the Willie Nelson of skateboarding, Jamie Thomas, Chris Cole, but then the second year, Jamie Thomas and Zero got in it, and then it was just on. I don't see any reason to do King of the Road unless you're going to win. You're not doing it for fun. Jamie just wants to win. And he usually has dudes that are all so f gnarly that if, if you're going to win the contest, you got to go through f Jamie and his crew. Yeah. Nobody on Zero wanted to work that hard to get to the finish line and be like, yeah, you got third place. You know, you put all that effort in for two weeks and you got third place. So we just kept telling ourselves, if we're working this hard, we gotta push it a little bit harder in order to make sure we win. And I feel like that philosophy, it has to be in your head. If it's not in your head, you're wasting time out there. These guys were working. There was no fun, they weren't having fun. It was like, we got to get this trick. We got to get this trick. We got to go over here. We got to get this trick. And that's why Zero won three times in a row. It was like they were in the army or something. And Jamie Thomas is known to really, really push his skaters more than usual. Like, failure is not an option. I'd seen him just whipping them. Perform, show me, make them work. When Jamie Thomas did it, he would pay people at the end. He's like, all right, I'll give you $200 to do that. Chief had tour guide for the city lined up. He had the spots of the city already lined up. I remember going here in 96, there's this thing over here, like, we'll go hit that. Like, it was, it was that crazy. I think he grew up perfecting everything he does and when we're in a contest, competition, whatever, 
He's got to do whatever he can to not only perfect the situation for himself, but everybody else. Like, he had it all down to a science. The first year was like trial and error. We're going to figure out what works, figure out what doesn't work. Second year, it was a little bit like finer tuned. Third year, it was like, you know what you got to do. You know where you got to be. Like, let's just get it damn done. Jamie Thomas was driven far beyond anybody. That's pretty much why we had to shut it down because it was like nobody could beat him. We took it as serious as like, it was as important as skater of the year. King of the road was that important. It's such a rad trophy. It's like handmade and it's the most prized trophy for me. Today, we went out, got a bunch of tricks, killing shit, and then we happened to come across flip dudes at the last spot we were at. We're killing those dudes. I think there's a lot of components that lead you to a King of the Road victory. I mean, obviously having dudes on the trip that are talented enough to do the challenges in the book or to do the tricks, but it's really just about that chemistry of everyone being so committed that it's the most important thing on earth at that point in time. We decided we would skate until the sun's coming up. So we're in the van. Go. We like it here. What was really good about Zero was with each of us, we wanted to be yeah, it's like the absolute best that we could be all the time. None of the dudes wanted to let a trick beat them. So if you have five dudes that want to beat the book and they're all going after anything that's in there, you're going to win. Double flip off the diving board at Barton Springs. Sounds like fun. Hey, what's the deal with your hand? My hand's broken. I took my cast off. I'm trying this shit anyways. Well, what makes a good King of the Road skater? Someone that's just down for boarding. I think we had a couple of the ultimate King of the Road skaters. I think that Cole or Tommy could have been the ultimate King of the Road skater. One year it was, you know, Cole was MVP and one year Tommy was MVP. Tommy and Chris Cole, the shit that they did in those 2004, five, and six, that was demonic. hit me for the most trophies of all. Who? His name is Chris Mother Cole. I think Cole beat a whole team by himself. I, I did. So. I did, yeah. He did. He hit me for three King of the Roads and two Sodies. That means he's got five trophies that I gave him myself. I mean, that, that's your ultimate King of the Road skater. I'm pretty sure Tommy Gunn's got 05 MVP. Tommy is like your quintessential hometown hero. Tommy Sandoval, I mean, when I think about it, the shit that he did, the stuff that I saw, that was 
incredible. I think I was new, like fresh am at that point. So I think Jamie's intentions for taking me was obviously partially filmed for the Zero video. And then also because I was ready to jump and go get it. If you can handle this, you can handle anything. First few King of the Roads, he was in his youngest, toughest, like most approved, like he was just going for it. Because this was a kid from Chula Vista. He had nothing, and all he could do was skate. So Jamie takes him under his wing. And I remember talking to Tommy and going, dude, your whole life is about to change. You have no idea. And he rose to the occasion, and it was a beautiful thing to watch. And he ends up on the cover of Thrasher. This was insane. But I came in the last four days of a two-week death show these guys were on. I was a mystery guest. <laughs> the year I went was like, washed up old dudes. You're gonna get a washed up old dude. And you know, and then we all stumbled off the plane. Zero, we're picking you up. Oh, you guys are bummed. <laughs> you got stuck with me. This was the first tour I had been on in 20 years. I, I had just gotten sober, so I was like one of those war vets, you know, I was super punchy, like, uh, uh. Grasso was just like sober only for like a week or two. It was gnarly. I think he like died two weeks before he OD'd, and he was basically back from the dead onto this King of the Road trip. It was crazy. I was in the van, I think, for four days or something like that, and like, they, those mother didn't sleep. They just drove and skated, drove and skated, sleep in the van. I got a piss. Grasso wasn't a hindrance at all. He was a legend. That dude ruled. He knocked our whole pool page out in like 30 minutes at Strawberry Pool. Like two weeks out of the hospital from being dead, you know? So, yeah, dude ruled. Zero was super cool. They won their money. Everybody f cheered and yelled. They put the whole team up against a wall to take a team photo. And then Jamie stopped the f photo, made them come find me, made sure I got in the photo for the whole team thing, which was sweet, you know? Class act, the Zero guys. Incredible skateboarders. My mind was blown. Oh, it's my child. There he is. All 40 pounds of mayhem and destruction. Here comes the terrorist. So, yeah. Oh, we got a chance at best slam now. What even happened? We're in Texas, right? Yeah. He's the president of America. Ah, uh, I don't know. Can I see it inside your mirror? Right here, blood. Whoa. Right here, right. Oh right there, my right God, there. dude. Knock on wood, you know, you just never want anybody to get hurt, even though that's kind of part of the game that these guys play. Matt Winterberg did this trick, not that, but did this trick perfectly. The Luganus, where you do a ski stance. And then Jamie had him do it one more time because he wanted to film it perfectly, and he blew out his ACL. Oh, that's it right there, I your knee. It's done. Oh, he says that his knee is really sketchy when it's straight, but then it feels somewhat stable when it's bent. And it was on like the second day of the trip. And again, obviously, we have no insurance, so I'll just be, just be paid cash. Just this dominates there. And it's called the Luganus because it's made so that you'll land and hit your head on the stairs. Yeah. Like it's, that's why it's called that. Oh, Probably won't be skating for a little bit, but uh, once we win this King of the Road, we'll be back next year and I'll take you guys out. Yeah. <laughs> I hope we win. <laughs> that's the reality. Somebody's getting hurt on King of the Road every year, you know?
they could get hurt just trying to like push themselves too far. You could definitely push yourself too far. Carbondale was a, it's a town in Colorado. They got the skate park there with a cradle. So that was kind of like the middle of the trip, blowout. Called these people up and we're like, we're for Asher Magazine, we'd like to have an event in your town. And these people were like, Carbondale, you're picking our town? Congratulations, first annual Carbondale run. They were so f hyped that we were coming to their town. They had been promoted as this big event, and so people were camping out in the soccer field. Carbondale turned into this huge, almost like festival of just like freaks and crazies from all over. I don't remember that time too well. I just remember it being madness. Little did we know that the, the park was pretty challenging and it was raining, and everybody got their mystery guests and went up there and had a freak out. We had a a rip ride. That's what we call it. When something's that good, it's called a rip ride. Like rip ride. It's a Venom song. The whole thing was crazy just because the police were there, but they were having a good time. They set up a BB gun gauntlet, and we have footage of the town sheriff shooting people with the BB gun. I think that's the only reason why we didn't get sued by the town. I mean, we were getting rides from the fire stations. I mean, it was just an all-out freakout. The night after the event, somebody snuck up the hillside and set a bunch of hay bales on fire. And uh, it made big news in the town, and that might have been their last big skateboard event they ever had. When we left that town, it was still smoking. But we never went back, but they were like first annual. They thought it was going to be like basically Sturgis for skateboarders. You like to think that there's a place where there's some live and let live, but then some asshole always spoils the fun, don't they? <laughs> A couple years ago, you know, a fireworks battle broke out. They're scared! We haven't even started, like, the halfway point challenges. And I'm like, all right, this is hilarious. But at the same time, like, we don't want to get kicked out of the spot before we get to do the challenges. Hey, 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 they're going to give us. They're going to kick us out. We can't do any of the challenges. Stop. All right, last one. Yeah, but I can't stop it. Hey, okay. <laughs> like, how am I going to stop it with that? In a field in the middle of the summer, it's dry as shit. And, you know, the fireworks are going off. And then someone's like, holy shit. We run outside, and there's like a f f entire field on fire. I didn't know that was going to happen. A couple of the guys got in big, big trouble over that. So needless to say, there's been a fireworks ban on King of the Road ever since. Hey, Mark. What up, Sam? What's going down? I don't know if you have any updates or not, but uh, just trying to see if the, uh, what your thoughts on the girl squad making it are. Maybe? That'd be sick. Feel free to tell them about the TV stuff. Yeah. Think uh, You think Burl would do it? He could be totally fired up on it, you know? Do you have a kid? Is Johnny Johnny Jones a potential for that? Johnny Jones could possibly do it. He's a hucker. That's what we need. You know who, you know who those other teams are. Yeah. <laughs> cool, man. Have a good one. I'll see you on Thursday. Okay, bye. I just found out that chocolate's going to do it, guaranteed. This year, we're filming King of the Road for television, and the teams are Chocolate, Toy Machine, and the defending champs, Birdhouse. Chocolate, they're going to be hard to beat because they're an all-terrain team. Like, everybody on the team can, like, shred everything. 
like kind of the cool guys, you know, but they're not like stiff or nothing. They're pretty fun loving. Toy Machine, Toy Machine's been on King of the Road several times before. They always do super good. This year though, Leo Romero, our skater of the year, he ain't going, he's got band practice. So it'll be interesting to see how they do without their anchor man. Last but not least, Birdhouse. That's Tony Hawk's company, although Tony Hawk has never gone on King of the Road. They're super good. They've got Clint Walker, who's this super intense Southern boy, really fun-loving, really aggro. Last year, he broke our windshield in a fit of rage. They've won it two times already, and they're gunning for a three-peat. The only other team to do that has been zero. Would you be a bone and burn out behind you guys? I don't think I'd feel any sort of way about it, personally. I'd be pretty pissed off. <laughs> When I looked at the Birdhouse one, I think that they have something similar to what we had when we were doing it. Everybody there is 100% committed and dedicated to it, and they're going to take it as far as necessary in order to win. Yeah, I don't know. If we win for the third time, I don't know what happens, and we all just quit skating. I don't know. I don't, I don't really know what happens. I guess we'll find out in uh, a couple weeks. Get down, man. Orange Jubilee Mad Dog 2020 to start. Before you even open the envelope. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Wash it down with a bottle of Strawberry Hill. And then open up that envelope and let it roll. It's going to be 12 days that you're not going to remember. You're going to go, I went on that. What happened? And you're going to have a shitty tattoo. Somewhere there's going to be a really bad photo of a hairdo you had. Girlfriend's not going to talk to you anymore. Are you worried about your girl? Oh. Yeah, she's going to be bummed. All that shit's happened on King of the Road. That's what it is. Get down. Get bloody. This is so... King of the Road deserves a look from the outside world because essentially King of the Road condenses what skateboarding is, road trips and fun and messing with each other and skateboarding. It'll be interesting to see how kind of people outside the skateboarding bubble view what we do. Let the games be We're gonna send these guys on the wildest, most jacked road trip of their entire lives. Oh my God. If they can survive this, they definitely deserve to be king of the road. You. This is gonna be nuts. Wow! He's lost his goddamn mind. Yeah. Oh! Shit!